Recent times have seen an increasing number of developments in afforested areas, and this video has been produced to develop and support good practice in managing forest residues across all future sites. The film will cover appropriate use of mulch on sites, use of brash, and what to do with tree stumps, plough furrows, and drains. In the first instance, developers are prompted to consider timber material as a marketable resource. Good practice intimates that any timber of diameter greater than 7 cm, including bark, should be considered as merchantable timber. The presumption is to market and remove from site as much material as you can, and there may be financial rewards for doing so, while avoiding negative environmental implications of leaving material behind where it is not needed. Following felling and the removal of timber off-site, a developer will likely be left with timber that is too small to collect and market. This can be termed forest residues. What are the options for this material? It's important that developers seek appropriate non-sham uses whilst avoiding waste legislation, and it is recommended the services of experienced specialists are sought for appropriate assistance. It's also advised that a long-term, site-specific management plan is written, one that clearly sets out activities and objectives. It is now considered good practice to include the provision of supporting key information prior to determination of the planning application, Section 36 application or similar consent. Information should include felling plans, reuse potential of material on site and any restoration proposals. After felling, some forest residue that is left on site may be in the form of a mulched material. But what are the intentions for use of this material on site? And is there a market for the residues in addition to the timber product? It is crucial to identify if there are valid uses on site for material for which no economic off-site use can be found, using professional ecological consultant input when necessary, and using professional water quality expertise when material is to be retained on site. When thinking about what type of material is appropriate for mulching, consider the size of chipped material, as this influences how it covers the ground. It either smothers or protects, for example. Also consider the rate of decomposition and nutrient release, and the duration of the material on site, as very finely chipped material may be washed off site, while large brash takes a long time to decay. The depth of material is also important, and this should be stated in the management plan. Most of the restoration objectives utilising the application of chipped forest material would not aim to smother the soil and the existing seed bank, potentially releasing large amounts of damaging nutrients from the breakdown of excessive material. This is particularly important in sensitive, nutrient-limited upland catchments, where inputs from forestry can cause nutrient issues in water bodies particularly nitrogen and phosphorus release. In summary, good practice ground cover of mulch is where light reaches the soil surface and the existing seed bank in the top few centimetres of soil. When making use of any brash material on site, a key consideration is whether there is a justifiable use that is environmentally acceptable. When using brash for soil protection under machinery, it's key to recognise the importance of brash as an essential element of effective harvesting systems. Referring to the Forestry Commission technical note, protecting the environment during mechanised harvesting operations, they discuss the use of brash mats and consider what types of mat and what depth of material, as well as any associated grazing regime. Also, what level of monitoring and maintenance is proposed? For example, is seed regeneration treatment likely to be required after use? If there are grazing animals present on a site, what is the grazing regime? Is there one at all? Deep, loose brash material makes it difficult for grazers to enter a site and control invasives and regeneration. This may need more hands-on management input over a period of 10 to 15 years, while the brash decays to ground level. Brash left on site for brash mats 
will have been compressed slightly and may be easier for grazers to access, but it will create a drier raised platform that will encourage different vegetation along the brash mat strip. In most cases, including embedded material, it is good practice to mulch over the brash and tie in the residues with surrounding site ground cover. This ensures even vegetation re-establishment across a site and prevents getting lines of drier vegetation along where brash mats once were. Removal of brash can cause excessive ground disturbance or other environmental damage, including pollution incidents, although in some situations it will be preferable for brash mats to be removed from site, especially when it may allow undesirable seedling regeneration. Care should be taken when considering what to do with tree stumps, as these should be harvested low and left in situ. Removal is generally not considered appropriate due to the damage it does to the soil structure. Plough throws, furrows and drainage ditches should be managed for establishing desirable water table levels. If developers are proposing to restore something with a low short sward, like a blanket bog, then it is important to even out the topography of the site to achieve a more uniform water table. Blanket bog water table typically ranges from 0 to 30 centimeters below the surface to an average of 5 centimeters. If forestry plough throws are high, then these may not re-wet and may result in lines of dry vegetation such as heather. There are ways, however, to minimize this variation in height between plough throw and furrow, and these include stump flipping, mulching the stump into the soil surface, the natural accumulation of limited volumes of brash and mulched material, although excessive material should not be used for this purpose. And finally, where furrows are deep, active blocking may be required to restore the hydrology. On some sites, it's possible that damming is required, and care should be given to appropriate materials used in their construction. Plastic pile dams are preferred for durability, hydrological seal and robustness, but there are other measures which are considered best practice for drains of different sizes. For example, peat dams for small drains. Some limited use of small brash can be used in deep drains to encourage vegetation in the channel, but should only be used in conjunction with methods to recover hydrology, such as pile dams. In all of this, it is important to consider environmental issues, including protection of the soil and encouraging and supporting the desired vegetation type. In summary, here are some key points that should be considered at the very earliest stages of a development proposal. Should development progress with the knowledge that there is a large amount of trees and forest material on site to manage? Gain an in-depth knowledge of the site. Is there an existing long-term management plan for the forest? Does all the forestry on a site need felled? Consider the possibility of multiple land use. Can the development and long-term forestry practice exist side by side? If the forestry does need to be removed, are phased felling and keyholing techniques possible on site to reduce volumes? Take into account the options for on-site storage of timber to allow a trickle feed to small local markets. Consider environmental impact assessment and any potential negative impacts associated with forestry operations. Is there a market for any material going off-site or other off-site sustainable or eco-friendly uses? What are the traffic implications for forestry operations associated with the site and removal of material to market? What are the options for the use of any forest residues left on site? And what are the objectives for this material? Whatever restoration you are attempting, you should be aiming for an overall improvement in the site. Whether this is driven by an improvement in productivity for land use, or an improvement in habitat quality and biodiversity. If you require any more information, get in touch with Scottish Natural Heritage, SEPA or Forestry Commission Scotland. We'll be happy to advise on best practice.